So hello everyone, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to Inkai Talks. The Inkai Talks, for those who haven't joined us uh, before and um, for other um, sessions, is the Inquest webinar series where we aim to connect our membership with the broader international higher education community to discuss today's uh, pressing, is uh, pressing issues. Today, we'll be considering the prospects for establishing an international higher education area, building somehow on the momentum created by, by the coming into force of the UNESCO Global Recognition Convention. I'm Fabrizio Trifiro, I'm a board director of Hinquahi, and I will be chairing this webinar. To help us inform our discussion, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome four excellent panelists representing stakeholders who would be expected uh, to play a key role in any eventual step establishment of an international area for higher education. So I would like to welcome Boren Chakrun, Director of the Policies and Lifelong Learning Systems Division at UNESCO, Andreas Cochran, Deputy Secretary General at the International Association of Universities, Chiara Finocchietti, President of the ENIC NARIC Network and also Director of the Italian NARIC, CIMEA, and uh, our own Fabrice Hennard, CEO of Inquahi. Now, before hearing from our speakers um, and engaging in discussion, a few words about housekeeping and a bit of context setting. As for housekeeping, we have muted all your microphones to help with the smooth running of the event, and your cameras have also been disabled, so we can't see you, but we are very keen to hear from you. These are indeed intended as interactive webinars, as opportunities for our community to engage with key stakeholders, with the experts in the field. So we do welcome and encourage questions and comments from delegates. Uh, you can use the Q&A function to ask questions at any time. Uh, also, the webinar will be recorded and it will be made available for free access after the event. I would also like to thank the Hinkway Secretariat, uh, Maria and Beatrice, who in the background are making sure that everything runs smoothly. Now, as for context setting, very briefly, why discuss or contemplate the possibility of creating an international higher education area in the first place? Now, I believe we, we all here recognize the vital role that higher education plays in finding the solutions and developing the mindsets required for addressing the challenges that our societies face. This is somehow why we are all here today, why we are so passionate about higher education. And as our communities have become increasingly interconnected at a global level and as the problems, the problems that we face are increasingly global in nature, this does call for increased international cooperation in higher education, cutting across the key function of higher education institutions, teaching, research, community engagement. But what are the policy infrastructures required to underpin and support this much needed international cooperation in higher education in, a, in an effective and efficient way? So we're talking about, for example, the mobility of students, knowledge, skills, workforce, the mobility of education programs and institutions, the establishment of academic partnerships and the recognition of less traditional learning pathways or uh, modes of learning, including, for example, online learning or work-based learning. The Global Recognition Convention has somehow led the groundwork for increased cooperation. Can we build on the momentum created by the UNESCO Convention to move towards an international higher education space? In a similar way, for example, in which the European higher education area developed from the Lisbon Recognition Convention and in which other regional higher education areas have developed uh, or are developing, most recently, for example, with the signing of the Joint Declaration on the Common Space in the Southeast Asian Higher Education. So, and, and what would this international higher education space look like? What would be required from the international education community to get there? What are the key challenges and opportunities? So these are some of the topics and questions that we will discuss in this webinar. I'll stop here. And without further ado, I would like to invite each of our speakers to start the conversation by giving a brief overview of the role that their organization play in international higher education space and also start sharing some thoughts and insight about why or whether you think making progress towards an international higher education area is a good idea. So uh, let's start uh, from you, Boreen. Over to you. Oh, thank you, Fabrice, uh, and uh, 
Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all our uh, audience today, wherever they are. And uh, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to uh, join this discussion today. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Inkai for uh, convening uh, this uh, discussion on this very important topic and, and I think timely. I think uh, UNESCO uh, doesn't require a lot of presentation, but uh, uh, just uh, to uh, mention again, that uh, UNESCO is the lead agency for education, is the unique um, uh, UN organization active in, in higher education, and uh, uh, it has the, that mandate of uh, uh, setting up a normative instrument, including on higher education, and you mentioned the Global Convention uh, on uh, Recognition of uh, Qualification Concerning Higher Education. I will come back to that uh, uh, in, in a few minutes. I think uh, the question that uh, we should ask is, uh, why we need uh, an international area of uh, higher education. And I would like to call it international area of uh, cooperation and solidarity in higher education. Uh, there are fa facts that uh, uh, call for that. First of all, um, is the growth of the sector itself. Uh, if we look at the data in 2000, we had 100 million students. Today, we have more than 256 million. So the growth of the sector is very, is very uh, important. And it, it tells a bit the attention of uh, the international community to uh, higher education. Also, we have seen tripling of the number of uh, uh, students who are on mobility from 2000 to uh, 2022. We have today more than 6.4 million uh, students who are, who are mobile and who are uh, learning in other um, uh, institutions than theirs and uh, outside of their own country. So these are important factors related to higher education that are driving for a discussion about uh, international um, area of higher education, international cooperation and solidarity. But there are other aspects that are important, I think, uh, that are worth to consider. One, uh, you started mentioning them, Fabrice, is um, the labor market change and, and the needs. A, a labor market and global um, economy that is interconnected, where we see mobility of uh, uh, people be it physical or virtual mobility and uh, this is uh, requiring better understanding of the skills and qualification that people hold and uh, matching with the, with the demand we see also uh, a growth of the knowledge economy that cannot be led and managed by one country we need uh, international dialogue for uh, what we call at unesco open science and open uh, open societies and that requires again uh, international uh, cooperation and, and solidarity. And uh, I think we need also common, common goals and common values uh, that drive universal um, uh, human rights and uh, that are important. And last but not least, we need, uh, we are for multilateralism. And multilateralism means uh, listening to each other, uh, uh, connecting different uh, communities, different nations, different culture. Uh, and all this calls for uh, an international area. Now, um, you referred to that, Fabricio, and I think all colleagues know, the Global Convention uh, on uh, Recognition of Higher Education uh, Qualification is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a very important vector for uh, setting the international uh, area of higher education. When we look at, uh, when I look at the convention and uh, starting from uh, the first articles, it does say before it comes to discussion uh, regarding the recognition of qualification, it does say that uh, the convention aims to promote and strengthen international cooperation in higher education. It's about supporting inter-regional initiatives, policies, and innovation for international cooperation in higher education. So the convention itself sets the scene for an international area for higher education. Of course, then how to define it, what are the structure that uh, I, I suppose we'll come back to that uh, later. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boren. Absolutely, we want to unpack exactly those uh, final questions that you raised. Um, Andreas, over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Fabrizio. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being with us today. It's uh, very excited about this format, uh, and uh, thank you very much for the information for the invitation. Um, yes, uh, Boren has already spoken on UNESCO, and uh, the International Association of Universities is actually housed uh, in uh, UNESCO headquarters. So we're very Glad to be a, a strong and close partner of UNESCO. Uh, the International Association of Universities was founded indeed under the auspices of UNESCO in 1950. So we're uh, looking back at a long and uh, proud tradition of international collaboration in higher education indeed. Um, maybe just 
quick few words on the international higher uh, so the international association of universities it is uh, truly a uh, forum setting for especially leaders of uh, higher education institutions to come together to have a forum in which they can speak about pressing issues in higher education um we do that uh, through conferences uh, through publications etc cetera, etc cetera. But uh, also, you asked us, in what ways do we uh, work towards international collaboration? Um, well, indeed, you know, uh, given the uh, global scope that we have, that's a no-brainer, so to speak. But we also work on four different uh, uh, priorities. Uh, one is the digital transformation of higher education that, of course, has become so very important over the last years. Uh, ethical or value-based uh, leadership, where we work capacity building and thought leadership uh, with the university presidents. Uh, one is uh, higher education and research for sustainable development, which of course is something I'm sure we'll be speaking about uh, in due course as well. And uh, at least uh, last, but definitely not least, uh, is um, uh, ethical internationalization. What does it mean in the higher education area today? So just to give you an overview of the IU, is the, an, as you call it, an international uh, higher education area a good idea? Well, obviously, integration, um, further collaboration um, is exactly as Bobin just also said, very much needed. And I think we all agree that uh, the mobility, knowledge and mobility, uh, the mobility of students and staff uh, is an important, a very, very important uh, uh, element of uh, higher education collaboration that we can only applaud and sustain and support and work towards. But then again, and I think this will come out of this discussion, what is the vision of an international higher education area? What is its political mandate? What is uh, the legislative form? What are the norms, regulations? What are the supporting uh, systems that uh, such a international framework would uh, need and have. Um, and uh, there, I would have to say that Fabrizio, you, of course, you mentioned at the very beginning that there is a very successful model. It's the, the Lisbon uh, model that then led to the European higher education area. However, that, of course, has a very strong political backbone where European nations came together. They commit to it. They commit financial resources to it. They commit uh, legislation towards it. They uh, commit uh, norms and, uh, and all the other um, tools that we need. Um, so the question really is to, uh, for us, I think, today is to discuss, are we creating a tool just for the end of creating a tool or what is the ultimate underlying framework that we wish to provide for and what is the business model of it what is the ultimate objective and um, i'll leave it at that for the time being because i'm sure we'll be getting to it thank you for being Thank you very much. Very good question, um, Andreas. Uh, absolutely. The, the, the political backbone that underpins the, the European education area will be uh, something interesting to, to discuss further later on. Chiara, um, the qualification recognition perspective, o over to you. Thanks, Fabrizio, and thanks to colleagues at Tinkai for, um, for the invitation to this relevant discussion. And uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. So maybe I can spend a, um, a little bit uh, just to say who uh, is the ENIC network. Uh, we are the uh, network of National Information Center on Recognition. Uh, we work very closely and we operate under the aegis of UNESCO and Council of Europe and we work very closely with the NARIC network, that is the network that operates under the aegis of uh, European Union. And we are present in 56 countries now, the countries that are part of the Lisbon Recognition Convention. And maybe it's worth to add that uh, even if we, have, we are the European network, uh, we have uh, countries from North America, like Canada and US, and from Asia Pacific, like Australia and New Zealand, because actually our scope is the uh, Europe and North America region of UNESCO. So what we do, we do provide information on recognition of qualification. And if you want to uh, select this, we can be considered the operational arm of the Lisbon Recognition Convention. The Lisbon Recognition Convention established the right for a fair recognition. And when there is a, a right, there is a duty for someone else. So we are, uh, let's say, established by national government to try to uh, enforce this right to a fair assessment of qualification. 
why uh, an international uh, 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 area for higher education would be relevant. From our perspective, uh, uh, there is a very concrete point. It would be very useful to uh, make a better service to citizens from our perspective, because our work is to uh, provide a fair assessment of recognition. That means uh, giving the correct value to a qualification. And for doing this, we need a network of uh, colleagues in different um, uh, parts of the world. We need uh, transparency tools. Uh, we need uh, information provision. And if all and uh, also we need this uh, from uh, national authorities, from competent authorities, uh, from what we call primary source of information. If we have all this information, we are able to assign the correct value to a qualification. And doing this. Uh, we allow the person to put, to put skills and knowledge at the service of society. And it, in this sense, I think that uh, um, giving this correct value, the proper value to qualification, means not only give a service to the person, but also doing a, a service to the society. Because we know that uh, uh, recognizing quality uh, qualification means recognizing quality education and quality knowledge. And we know the role of uh, authentic knowledge for societal and human growth. So I will stop here for the moment and back to you, Fabrizio. Thank you very much, Chiara. And uh, that uh, uh, leads somehow perfectly to, to quality assurance, to the quality assurance perspective, how to underpin that confidence in the quality of qualifications. Fabrice, over to you. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Fabrizio. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Yes, actually, um, um, Inquahi co may contribute to the to the creation of uh, an international higher education area because it is uh, fully global, fully global through uh, its membership, through the partnerships, and you know, through through its its mandate that is to create impact globally. So membership, because Inquahi covers the, the, the all regions of the world, its board represents um, all seven regions with the, no one left out. And uh, amongst the funding principles are uh, diversity and inclusion. So in, pra in practical terms, it means that uh, Inquahi works with all stakeholders to the extent they have official status. Um, and the diversity is also included in, in uh, is reflected in its membership of more than 320 uh, uh, members. So we can say that Iquahi is not, is not uh, a club for the happy few or the club of QA experts, but a global player and core in higher education systems. Second is the partnerships. And the importance given by Inquahi to the partnerships uh, in, in order to reach out communities that an international network alone may not be able to access. I'm thinking of the global ones, such as IAU, UNESCO, but also many regional organizations, RIASES in Latin America, SACAN in Africa, AUNQA in, uh, in Asia, and also thematic networks uh, through which Inquahi could tap into a unique expertise that would benefit the global uh, community. I'm thinking of the Global Academic Integrity Network, for instance. But the third block of uh, of, uh, of activities that uh, uh, are definitely international relates to the mandate because through its strategy, we aim to create change and make an impact for all types of higher education providers and also learners, students and lifelong learners. Actually, Inquahi seeks to support members so that quality assurance is the lever for the preservation of quality and improvement of quality for the ultimate benefit of, uh, of learners. And over the years, since 1991, years of establishment, Inquahi has been expanding opportunities uh, to create impact by mobilizing a variety of tools, approaches, among which you have the uh, reviews of uh, external agencies now against our international uh, standards, producing a corpus of knowledge to our uh, global uh, study on trends in quality, in quality assurance, helping institutions and agencies with financial support for capacity building, organizing events, uh, and we may, ex we may extend the dialogue that, that amounts uh, uh, quality assurance and including a, a vast range of stakeholders and also promoting and disseminating the initiatives for their relevance and impact. So in Quahi allowing the members to showcase what they're doing uh, in, in quality assurance. 
So yes, I would say that uh, uh, by essence, there is a true interest in setting up an international higher education area. Maybe the first, because the world is uh, is becoming more international that is organized and uh, higher ed is exactly part of that dynamic. And also because uh, um, it's become impossible for an institutional program to think solely on the local and national scale, as as uh, as you as as you know, all institutions are intrinsically involved in uh, international uh, missions, such as the integration of uh, the SDG. Yesterday, I participated in a master class organized with the United Na Nations, and you see that very few quality assurance standards include the SDGs. And I admit that. There is no real global platform for dialogue on high education. There are actually a multitude of transnational events and projects, mainly on a national and region, national and regional scale, but very few are truly international, involving, I mean, all the stakeholders and debating together on the variables that affect higher education globally. I'm thinking of uh, in, in, artificial intelligence or uh, environmental protection. And... Oh, and I think this kind of uh, higher education era may be of uh, of interest because the internationalization of higher education, as it has been already highlighted, has not been systematically accompanied by mutual recognition of diplomas and, and skills, while population movements, uh, whether chosen or involuntary, are developing rapidly. I'm thinking of students uh, uh, displaced by conflicts, for example, but also all those seeking uh, training abroad because their country uh, doesn't offer uh, uh, the expected uh, uh, opportunities. And I think for Inquahi, it's very important through this kind of higher education area to uh, to address the new global dynamics that sometimes we're not taking sufficiently uh, into account. I'm thinking of the rapid expansion of the quality assurance uh, agencies all over the world, also expansions of the regional quality standards. Of course, the European ones well known, but also RIASES in Latin America, AU and Sotestigia, African, uh, those African Union. And also taking into account the new types of higher education delivery, badges, micro-credentials, the, 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 the expansion of private sector, of the non-university uh, providers, uh, new corporations, between Africa and China, hubs created, being created, I'm thinking of Morocco for the French speaking uh, Africa, new consortia such as European universities. So all this make a big, a huge change. And sometimes our uh, organizations are, and our members don't know how to address them. And 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 above all, and I'm speaking from the Inquahi point of view, uh, what is key is the reputation and credibility of higher education. And that requires compliance with quality standards that are internationally recognized and accredited by bodies that are themselves internationally reputed. And I think that the an international higher education area would be the ideal place to discuss how quality could be safeguarded. And as Boren highlighted, reminded us, the Global Convention is a formidable instrument for cooperation and solidarity. And we know that quality assurance is one of the, of the pillars. It's very instrumental in the implementation of these global conventions. So that's for my, my, my first Thank remark. you very much, Fabrice. Um, that, that's great. And I like a number of things you said. I mean, you, you talked about there are different platforms internationally. There are, but for example, the, the, we have Hinkway. We have... Uh, the International University Association. We have uh, the different regional network. Well, the, we got the any network in Europe, and then there is a growing um, movement in developing qualification recognition bodies. But sometimes, this often they say these communities do not talk to each yep. other probably as often they should be. And in fact, I'm very glad today that we we, be, we have been able to bring all, all some of uh, these key stakeholders together. Um, now, I think unsurprisingly. You, we all agree that uh, developing an international education area is a good idea, and uh, the international education community should be looking to work towards that objective. But I guess, and all of you have somehow pointed out that the main problem is how do we get there? And and perhaps here we're going to start to um, uh, to really understand better the different perspectives from the different communities. So I would like really to to start. Uh, by asking you, what do you think uh, 
this international higher education area really should should would look like in terms of uh, the key infrastructures uh how the international education community can get there what what, what do you think are the main building block really that we should consider in uh, in moving towards an international education areas uh, andreas mentioned uh the political backbone for example um so i'll uh, I'll, I'll, I'll open it uh, t um, to you guys. Uh, perhaps, Boren, would you like to, to start us off? No, thank you, Fabrizio, and thanks to uh, my colleague, Andreas Chiara and, and, and Fabrice for uh, putting quite important point. I think uh, it, it gives us a bit, uh, maybe to cluster a bit the idea uh, uh, around the three aspects that I think are important. The, the first one is uh, uh, a question of power. And it relates to what uh, Fabrice finished it with. Uh, either we consider the uh, this uh, call it international area as a, a soft power and and maybe less uh, call it a, uh, less prescriptive, including uh, in terms of the standards, in terms of the uh, call them uh, the normalization of of the uh, of the approach. So that's uh, in a way an extreme part, and then uh, uh, soft power with less and much more, I would say, agile and, and more open, or more hard power, and that will require more uh, common standards, common, um, call them uh, rules, uh, uh, fundamental uh, principles that are uh, common. Uh, I think we, we, we can consider first in terms of the, the power and, and uh, where, where to place the cursor. And uh, given that we are in a multilateral uh, environment, uh, obviously the geopolitical dimension uh, is very important and take into account the political dimension in this case in, uh, in uh, I would say, macro regions that are not necessarily having the same governance model and not the same, um, call them, driving forces. So I think uh, uh, that aspect is, uh, is important. The second is uh, uh, how we blend or how we link uh, four actors that are important here. The political, and that's governments, the institutions, and that's uh, universities. The uh, professional bodies, these are, it could be uh, credential evaluator, it could be faculties, it could be, and networks. And how uh, this international area will bring uh, these uh, different stakeholders together. Today, when I look at uh, uh, our the landscape of the conventions, we have 100 countries that have ratified one or the other of the conventions, be it the global or the regional. 35 already ratified the, glo the, the global convention, but in each of the region, we have also a number of countries that have ratified uh, the regional convention. So there is already a mass of uh, countries that believe into the uh, international, uh, I would say, internationalization of higher education, the recognition of qualification, transparent, fair, inclusive recognition of qualification. And as Fabrice mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, they also believe in the importance of quality assurance because uh, underpinning the, the convention is the quality assurance. So we have, um, in a way, already an infrastructure that uh, is important. But that infrastructure is for now a political one. Where we need is to bring the three other actors that I mentioned earlier, universities, and that's uh, the International Association of Universities, regional, of course, uh, uh, as, uh, association or, or, or networks. Uh, that's, of course, uh, always related to um, the professional bodies and, and uh, regulators or uh, credential evaluators. And we have, uh, again, a number of, of these associations. And, uh, of course, the networks, because uh, and um, what Chiara presents, uh, the ENIC NARIC, is an important one. But the Global Convention foresee uh, a network of networks, if I can say so. And that's a very important uh, part of it. But I would say that, and I stop here because colleagues will, will come in and can come later. I think trust would be a very important aspect in, in all this. Uh, if we are not able to build trust, political trust, quality assurance trust, uh, supported trust, trust of uh, uh, the commitment for cooperation and solidarity, it's very hard to see how in, in this global context of uh, sometimes uh, cooperation, but also competitiveness, or, com uh, or sometimes it's even worse than competitiveness. So uh, 
And again, the sustainable development goals could be that framework of, of collaboration that can be considered, but we cannot be naive. There are other drivers. Artificial intelligence is one of them. Uh, the globalization of the economy is, is another one. Uh, I think the polarization of societies and the polarization of the world is another um, uh, factor. So I think we shouldn't be naive regarding that. And that comes to the, 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 the first point that started with soft power versus hard power and something that can maybe be a cursor where we can uh, we can put so that we can advance. Sorry, I've been long. Over to you. No, that's perfect. That was really interesting, Boren. Thank you very much. Now, I'll, I'd like to go to, to you, Chiara, because uh, Boren mentioned uh, uh, the idea of developing a network of uh, network of credential evaluators. You mentioned how the ENIC network can be regarded, and it is the operational arm for the implementation of the Lisbon Convention. Uh, how do you see the prospect of developing an operational arm for the implementation of the Global Recognition Convention? Um, is there a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of work to do yet? Probably not every country have established yet uh, national information authorities. And Boren, you may also want to come in here as well, uh, Chiara. And and again, the main question: what what is your view about the building blocks? How how could we get there? Uh, thanks, uh, and thanks also to Boren for providing this, uh, for uh, clustering, helping us in uh, advancing in the reflection, clustering this uh, uh, concept. So um, I would say, um, actually, that from a recognition perspective, we are already working in this direction. And uh, um, as Boren said, uh, the, uh, let's say we have already a natural platform that for us is the Global Recognition Convention, of course, for this, uh, for this cooperation. And uh, um, we uh, are the oldest network. Actually, we were born before the Lisbon Recognition Convention, in the sense that the centers were born before exactly to solve recognition problems, to support mobility, because there was the, the, the clear vision at that time that mobility was an essential building blocks of building European integration and building a, a Europe of knowledge with this sort of knowledge. So. We are the let's say uh, let's say oldest net network, but we are not the only one. That's uh, actually the good news. And that since already sometimes actually since several years, uh, there are other networks uh, of uh, uh, national information center or national implementation structure according to the different terminology in the different region in Latin America and Caribbean, in Africa and the African region and the Asia Pacific region, and actually. We must, uh, and in this sense, uh, we also have to acknowledge the role that of UNESCO, that UNESCO is planning, facilitating and coordinating this dialogue among the different regions. This is already a reality. We are, uh, let's say, uh, in dialogue with each other. We are working together to understand what are the respective uh, priorities, uh, uh, the uh, different, uh, let's say, um, issues, main issues on which we are working on. So this is already, uh, something that is happening. And for us, I would say uh, this is a very good news because uh, uh, when we speak about recognition, we always speak about reciprocity and uh, having a network of uh, uh, colleagues on which you can rely. Because when we speak about recognition, we always think about recognizing foreign qualification to our country, but actually it's also a way to uh, support uh, correct recognition of domestic qualification abroad. So there is an important point of uh, um, reciprocity. So uh, I see um, in this cooperation, I can see already some point uh, that we are trying to put forward. One is, uh, of course, uh, how this cooperation is, uh, and this is, I mean, looking to what will be the characteristic of this area, so, of course, supporting mobility. That's uh, the uh, one of the our key point. Transparency information provision is the second point. This is essential. Um, I would say third point is knowledge sharing uh, uh, and common understanding. In this sense, also the Global Recognition Convention provides a, um, a very important uh, reference because uh, uh, we, when we speak about, uh, we are very diverse. That's uh, an asset, the rich diversity uh, that we have in a global landscape. But exactly for this, we need to have a common language, something that when we say if we refer to something, we have to be sure that we send the same meaning to this term. Um, cooperation and innovation and solidarity, as Brent said. Uh, in this cooperation, we very often we find ways to innovate. Because if I look to 
colleagues that in another region, in another country are doing something differently, this could be a, a powerful inspiration to improve uh, what I'm doing. And of course, uh, this uh, network of networks is key to um, deal with some common challenges that, are, that don't stop at national borders. AI, I mean, AI, it's a high risk uh, component in access and admission, for instance. Uh, transnational education, here quality plays a crucial role. Um, uh, so there are a number of uh, topics that we need to work on. And of course, in this, the role also of quality, and I would like to link to this, it's very important, not only for formal recognition, because of course we look to quality of a qualification, quality of uh, an institution, but also quality as a trust enhancing tool. Because, uh, I mean, at least from a European perspective, quality is not only about quality assurance, but it's also quality enhancement to help all the system grow and to, let's say, help to build this trust. And I will stop here for the moment. Back to you. Thank you very much, Chiara. Uh, that, that's really helpful. Um, more meat on the fire. Uh, Andreas, uh, I'd like to go back to you. Uh, you're ready in your initial contribution. You laid out some of the uh possibly building blocks that perhaps underpin the develop as a have underpin the development of the European education area. Uh, your view about how what would be the best approach to get there, what would be the main considerations to uh, to keep in mind? All the speakers before me uh, have very rightly pointed out I think the core objective for all of us is to build trust. The trust, trust between all the actors. Chiara said it, Fabrizio, uh, Fabrizio said it, and Boren, of course, as well. Um, and why trust? Because it's the only basis on which we can cooperate at the global level. It is the only basis that will make things happen in the end of the day. And uh, But for trust, we also need to have um, a clear understanding of what is the playing field on which we are trying to take this trust you know use this trust and 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 there i think speaking you know as the deputy secretary general of the international association of universities we are in contact with universities from all around the world especially in the global south in east asia uh, in latin america and uh, and they see trust very differently to what possibly we here in Europe uh, uh, perceive as, as as trust. So this is kind of a um, more ideological answer at the moment, because if we are thinking about international collaboration, which is, of course, the underlying theme here, what is better international collaboration? Is it more fluidity between nations, uh, better uh, an enhanced, uh, facilitated uh, mobility between students and staff. We always, the, I mean, the Global Convention always speaks of uh, um, uh, trying to uh, increase the circulation of knowledge and people. And that, that's beautiful. That's absolutely correct. And of course, in the IAU, we completely subscribe to that. But what is better collaboration? I mean, what we're seeing in the IEU internationalization service that we carry out every year, we see deep inequalities in international flows of people from the East to the West, from low and middle income countries to high income countries, um, where higher education is used as a commodity, as a huge financial factor. Um, uh, what we need is, in, go back and really concentrate on the word circulation so that the it really goes back also to the countries from whence these people seeking better education and better opportunities uh, from whence they come. And um, these are kind of the debates I think that we would have to clarify and which terms we actually engage at the political level. Boren said it himself. Uh, that this is really at the UNESCO intergovernmental level and at the United Nations level, that these, that this playing field needs to be discussed so that at the end of the day, we know that when we play football, it's 11 against 11 on an equal playing field. Um, because what we have, and here we go to the second level that Doren just spoke about, the higher education institutions, they are torn at the moment. The business model of the universities grosso modo, is broken at the moment. Why? Because they are torn between the tensions of collaboration, which is a 
decades or a, a century old uh, part of humanity um and and, and competition of course uh, and competition is uh, has more and more in the last 30 40 years been propelled through rankings uh, through uh, government policies in that regard and are also uh, informed by national interests, national economic and uh, security issues that uh, we are seeing more and more in a multipolar world. So when you ask me about the building blocks, <laughs> it, I think it is a political discussion of forming one vision and it's going to take a long, long time. But I do believe that um, one starting position would indeed be the SDGs that we know that these are all pertaining to all of us for a common humanity and survival. And I think it is the natural departing point on which to collaborate on, on through which we then could also have the associations and the networks and through which also then quality assurance and um, recognition processes could also have its life. But uh, I really think it is at the global level that we come together for an international higher education area, because otherwise we're just going to propel the inequalities and the injustices that we see at the global level and just take it from uh, one uh, quite well-functioning regional work, uh, like the European higher education, to the global, and I don't think it would work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, I think you articulated very well some of the important political challenges. I was going to ask uh, about this tension between cooperation and competition, and somehow is that uh, we need that political drive that uh, one is accepting somehow the the the, uh, the yeah. natural competition between uh, institutions. However, can develop a framework, a global framework of com of cooperation, where a number of issues will need to be solved. For example, the funding model. For, for higher education, that would be one. Uh, Fabrice, before I come to you, I wanted to uh, quickly ask you, Andreas, a follow-up question, which is, uh, we're talking about trust, and uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a, a tricky question. To what an extent, from an institutional perspective, there is trust towards regulation? Or put it another way, uh, to what an extent institutions see regulation somehow as a challenge, as something, because here, I mean, th this platform today somehow will be a, a, a starting, you know, the starting point for a conversation about how, we, for example, from a quality assurance perspective, quality assurance agencies can uh, review the regulations so as to allow the uh, the flourishing of in innovative, equitable uh, and quality as well and relevant uh, education provision. Is the issue of regulation something that we, that it is debated within the International University Association, for example? Yes, absolutely, of course. I mean, um, I'll give you an example. When uh, university presidents come together uh, again now in uh, at Sofia University in Tokyo on 22nd to 24th of November, uh, it's our international conference, uh, regulations, of course, will be part of our discussions with university presidents. Why? Because they are bound by them. Um, they are bound by them at the regional, at the local, at the regional. Funding, you said it yourselves, are directly uh, uh, part and parcel of the wider frameworks in which they operate. And, uh, um, you know, universities, they are... You, they are uh, their prime mission is generate the generation of knowledge. Um, frameworks, regulations, of course, are part of compliance. So the, if you're asking me whether universities are it's strange or find it difficult to comply with the political processes that bring about frameworks and regulations, the answer is yes and the answer is no. It depends on their interests and it depends on uh, their uh, their business model and it depends on how they can see how their three missions can come to fruition uh, in the best possible mode. So, um, of course, there is also the discourse of epistemic cultures and traditions. And if we see global regulations, they must be elastic and tolerant and accepting of local conditions. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andreas. And uh, Fabrice, before I come to you, I'd like to invite Boren to uh, to, um, to <laughs> interview. You. I, I will prepare the, I mean, the, the ground for for uh, Fabrice uh, definitely. No, I, I think I wanted to uh, unpack a bit the, the the trust dimension because, uh, of course, we speak about trust, and it's very important that we say what are the ingredient of of trust. And I I think uh, I mean, and colleagues already referred to them. Uh, quality assurance is definitely an important factor for building trust. And I, I think Fabrice is, is best placed to, to speak about that. But it's not only about quality assurance. It's about also information, data sharing. And that's something that we are uh, still weak in, in, in advancing internationally. The way we are collecting data on higher education is still very uh, uh, it, uh, basic. And, and in some continent, to give an example, in Africa, out of 55 countries, we are collecting data only on 16 countries. So, uh, I mean, we are in a situation where, uh, of course, the information exists somewhere, but but it, it's not shared, it's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, available to uh, all stakeholders. The third uh, aspect is, for me, common and fundamental principles. We cannot create an, an area where uh, we disagree on some common principles. And I think uh, that's where uh, the, there is a need and that's where the uh, action of uh, uh, universities, networks, and of course, the United Nations uh, is very important. The fourth is common language. And again, here, the cursor can be, it can be common language. And that would mean uh, we understand what do you mean by accrediting an institution. But it can be common language in a much harder, man, meaning we have common parameters, we have common criteria. And, and, and the last, for me, is important, is the multilateral fora for dialogue and to address what Andreas was mentioning. If we if we uh, close our eyes and we say, things will have to go as they are, but we will try to quality assure them. That's not, I think, what we would like to drive. We'd like to drive more inclusive world uh, and uh, uh, having uh, higher education as a global common good. So if, if that's the, the what is driving the international higher education, then uh, that requires more than uh, just uh, Call it a, a convention or ratifying convention or having a quality assurance uh, guidelines. I think it, the trust requires much more than that. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Boren. Fabrice, uh, back to you with the original yeah. question and any other comments you would like yeah. to, yeah, yes. to share. But actually, the key, the key word <clears throat> today <clears throat> is trust. Actually, that's exactly the one I, 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 I had. Uh, at first, I think that the, the, there is a risk that this uh, international higher education uh, remain just a concept. And on the other, on the other hand, if it's fully operational, then it may compete with uh, with you know regional areas that has proven uh, uh, their worth, or, or some are seeking to be established. That's amazing the number of regional networks that you have. I discovered United Arab for higher education, for instance, or, or enlaces in Latin America. I mean, there there are quite a lot, and and and. The, these uh, international higher education area should add value and should not and could not replace the regional uh, dynamics. So it means to me that it, it must take a, a specific form. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, this question of trust may be addressed from, from different perspectives, but I think two are important, at least from a cure perspective. It's first is, is understanding the situation and the challenges as they are today, while stepping one step ahead of the issues that will matter. And, and Boren just mentioned that we think we know, but actually we don't know really, or not, ex not exactly. And second, so first is understanding the situation. Second is stimulating, stimulating the tran transformative power of higher education, how to help higher education to, to improve in a trustworthy setting. Uh, um, and and uh, because if we if we if we establish this kind of of uh, of uh, intentional era, it's good to have a, a, a robust, a sound diagnosis and progress on that. But I think it will be also relevant to help uh, higher education sector, you know, to to move ahead in terms of relevance of higher education. Do we meet the needs of the individuals, countries, and and the global world in terms of efficiency? given the scarcity of public funds and also impact of higher education. Are we really sure that all what we're doing in higher education has an impact on the, on the learners? And then I was thinking, well, if I had to, you know, to set from scratch a higher education area, 
of course, as an administrator, I would think about uh, about tools, about processes, about an organization, and I'm not sure that's really what we what we would like, uh, because we would create a new body and uh, probably uh, going uh, uh, or heading inexorably towards bureaucracy. But I think one one element is is probably uh, uh, m missing is the culture of the dialogue. I mean, we have lots of events we, we, we discuss, but do we have really a dialogue that helps us to understand uh, exactly what we want to say? Uh, I mean, higher education is very complex. The words is super complex. We are using uh, 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 English as lingua franca, but all we are all in countries are all uh, marked by by values by 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 ethics by some philosophy and and it's very difficult to to work and probably because we don't know how how to have this culture of dialogue and interconnection with all those who make higher education a reality so i think there are these three major players that Boren uh, uh, um, and andreas uh, reminded institutions agencies governments but what about student representatives, the corporate world, trade unions, the media who are so sensitive to rankings and less so to to uh, to, to quality assurance? So uh, maybe we, if we think about um, an international higher education area, we may think of of uh, a concept that is slightly different from the regional, you know, areas, the regional higher education space that we know today. Uh, otherwise, it would be a, a, a big body or a federation of federation. I'm not sure it will work or it may end up in a kind of a, a bureaucratic or the big machinery disconnected from the reality. Uh, and, and maybe we could find a, a, a you know, kind of balance between uh, having a platform facilitating dialogue around higher education in a regular manner and at the same time, be punctuated and materialized by some visible activities. I think having both is 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 key, uh, so that the this international higher education area means something not only for us because we're engaged in it, but also for the whole community. And and uh, having a rapid, measurable, uh, perceptible concretization of it may probably you know give 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 some some uh, elements of of, uh, of of hope and and understanding also by the whole community so it, it's not something that we're as experts you know designing because we think it, we find it it irrelevant so that's my thank you fabrice and and you do you did mention something absolutely cr critical which is that there there is a range of stakeholders out there that also need to be involved in the conversation. Students, of course, um, uh, the corporate world industry, uh, absolutely critical. Um, we, we did we did think when we were setting up this webinar, we did think about having more stakeholders involved, but then uh, it wouldn't have become manageable, but definitely something that any follow-up conversation, a serious conversation about developing an international education area has to take into account. Now, I'm conscious that there are actually a number of questions that um, um, delegates have posted on the Q&A, and I would like to take some of these. Um, now, uh, Simin Khan, uh, Yusuf Sai, sorry if I murdered your name, um, has uh, posed a number of uh, um, good questions there. I'm going to pick one or two. Uh, what measures can be taken to simplify and standardize recognition of qualifications across countries? And the second one, uh, what successful models of international collaboration exist for quality assurance and accreditation? So di different uh, um, uh, speakers here may want to approach uh, uh, these different questions. Um, Chiara, Boren, uh, perhaps around uh, measures that can be taken to simplify and standardize recognition of qualifications across mm -hmm. countries. Any particular insight there that you would like to share? Let me start with that, but then I think colleagues uh, can respond regarding the accreditation. Uh, uh, first, uh, every uh, regional and the global convention has operational guidelines that uh, in a way give the stakeholders the, the approaches, the tools, the resources to, to, to do that in a fair, transparent 
in, in, in a simple manner. But uh, I think uh, uh, as we are now working on the operation guidelines of the global convention, uh, what we call on, on the countries and on the credential evaluators is to uh, uh, be in a way tolerant with the, with the, uh, with the individuals and ensure that uh, the effort of the recognition is on uh, the institution, not on the individual, and in a way uh, engage with the, with the individuals. And some of it is related, for example, to the refugees or displaced persons who are moving without necessarily having the, their full qualification and, and all the documentation. But the spirit of the operation guidelines that still have to be validated by the state parties is really about simplification and is about inclusiveness and uh, being flexible to uh, in the implementation of the of the convention. So I think uh, we are guided by that, and I would like to reassure our colleagues that that's what is guiding the state parties. is is not as uh, as an individual is the state parties to the convention, and we see that in 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 Lisbon and and Kara, I'm sure can can uh, elaborate on that as well. Over. Thank you, Boreen. Kara, would you like to come in here? Yes, thanks. I will um, build uh, on what Boren already said. Um, I think uh, uh, there are some, at least from our experience, uh, what uh, could work to simplify and streamline some procedure uh, could be, first of all, uh, as I say, the kind of uh, common understanding. As Boren said, common understanding, of course, according to uh, a clear principle. And I think for us, the principle and the standard are, are, of course, in the regional convention and in the global convention. So we have a very clear um, guidelines regarding principle there. Um, but then uh, what is the maximum consensus around how we do implement this principle in practice? So this will be a first step. Um, for instance, from the European perspective, we have also this kind of manual for a European recognition area. What is the maximum consensus about how to implement certain principle in practice? So this will be one uh, element. The second element uh, is uh, training. Uh, maybe this could be old but goodies in the sense that uh, also one important step uh, for our network was to have a common training to share recognition practices, to share in practice what we do. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, taking recognition from one country and discussing among the, all the other different countries, how they do recognize, why they do recognize in a certain way instead of, or in another. Also to, with the country interested, of course, to a better understanding and maybe change also uh, eventually recognition procedure. So let's say uh, community building training can help to build a community of practice in this sense. Um, Another element uh, is uh, uh, digitalization, in the sense that uh, um, in our experience, uh, uh, digitalization can, can support. Of course, we know that ethics is not te techniques. We cannot solve everything with digitalization. But uh, what we are used to say is that uh, interoperability is the is one of uh, the world is one of the digital world for cooperation. So interoperability, digitalization, digital credential can support to streamline part of the procedure, for instance, for verification of authenticity. Again, this not solve everything, but it could, uh, uh, let's say, streamline the process of recognition and also maybe easy the work of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the order of the qualification. So maybe mm, this could be just a few uh, ins from my side on this. Thank you very much, Chiara. Now, I did mention um, the question about successful models of international collaboration for quality assurance and accreditation, and perhaps, uh, Fabrice, you may want to take that. There is another question, which perhaps is closer to you, Andreas, yeah. mm -hmm. which is um, uh, the implication of globalization on higher education policy and governance. So perhaps reflecting on the implication of globalization for uh, the, the governance of higher education institutions. Uh, Fabrice, uh, would you like to yeah. respond yeah, yeah. to one? Yeah. To respond, to respond to that, and yet yeah, it resonates actually with the discussion on, on the on the on the relevance of setting a higher education area. Because actually, we could uh, we could discuss it. That's what we're doing at Inquahi you know, on on the on the the different models called co international cooperation model, or supposedly successful. Because uh, 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 the model may be successful in one country and absolutely a disaster in another country. But that's the purpose of the activities that we're having, and also the events that that uh, that we're holding. I think why because we we address that issue from uh, the lens of quality assurance, of course, because it is our mandate. However, 
uh, it's not however said in addition, I think um, uh, uh, the complexity of higher education would require probably a more multifaceted approach. And, uh, and addressing quality with quality assurance uh, practitioners and also with the other uh, uh, organizations who have a different perspective, a complementary perspective is absolutely key. To design a successful quality assurance model, for instance, require also to have a, 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 the right legal, the right legal setting, and the right training of faculty, and the right status. And this is there are these dimensions that we don't necessarily address at Inquahi. And there are other dimensions that are not necessarily addressed by by Chiara or on on or Andreas. And I think there are common points, even though there the the, the higher education is. Uh, 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 in inherently diverse, there are common points of interest that are worth discussing together. Uh, 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 raising uh, raising resources, ensuring improving uh, the, the quality, enrolling vulnerable students. I mean, you have many themes like this could, could be addressed from the various perspectives. And that's what we do. Just see the titles of our conferences. I mean, they sometimes tend to overlap they don't actually, because we look them through a specific lenses. And for me, the relevance, you know, the, the value of having this space or this dialogue would be to be together and to, to show a, a more systemic, uh, you know, answer or more systemic, uh, you know, approach to a complex problem, an intricate problem that could better probably serve uh, those who raise these kind of questions. Mm. Thank you, Fabrice. Andreas. Um, would you like to give a stab at answering the question around impl the implication of globalization for higher education governance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a difficult one, but uh, I'd be uh, very happy. Um, yeah, of course. Um, uh, higher education leaders nowadays, they cannot do without being globally engaged. And it is very, very important for them, uh, for higher education leaders, to have those skills, to have that outlook, to have that on their radar, and to then um, provide for within their institutions um, the right ways of implementing a internationalized perspective. And that has to do with economics, has to do with the fair inclusion of uh, international students, it has to do with uh, research. Um, Boren mentioned a very, very important uh, tool or a recommendation that UNESCO is providing also at the IAU, we're just coming out with a new statement on open science. Uh, why open science? Uh, access to data. Uh, we've been speaking about how important data and knowledge and access to it is. And of course, that needs to be clarified at a, the international level and then also then implemented at the institutional level. Um, uh, have teaching, uh, the inclusion of a, how I, a global vision, an international vision into the curricula is incredibly important in this day and age. And again, I'm hinting at the SDGs for international collaboration. We want to come together, students, staff in universities, politicians, all stakeholders. They need to have a clear international appreciation of uh, the challenges that uh, we're all facing. Um, so there are many, many, many layers on which governance is impacted by uh, globalization. Um, I think I, I think I would like to speak that we need to have a global discussion about these things, but ne not necessarily a globalist framework uh, when it comes to these discussions. We have to be clear that there are local um, conditions and local situations, local knowledge that needs to be protected from uh, a globalist approach, which then would be uh, something where we all have shared common standards and common regulations, but mm. detriment maybe of some of the very uh, precious resources that I just spoke about. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. There are other very interesting questions, which uh, are actually pretty uh, relevant and pertinent to our topic of discussion, um, development of an international education area. Um, so one is, can we plan a single accreditation agency at least for member countries to make education movement more transparent and easy? A follow-up question or observation is, 
Why isn't there a global quality assurance body with universal standards that all quality assurance agencies can adopt to build trust, harmonize practices, and secure international recognition for higher education institutions? Now, this is very interesting questions, in particular for an organization like Inquahi, which, uh, and I'll let uh, Fabrice come in here, of course, uh, given that um, Inquahi is ideally positioned somehow to act as that actor, that network that can lay out uh, some common international standards. Uh, they may not be a unique single international accreditation body for every country, also because uh, we need to recognize the diversity of our education systems, but that definitely is scope for harmonize our education accreditation systems through organizations such as Hinkwe. But uh, Fabrice, would you like to, to comment on this one as well? Yes, yes, ab ab absolutely. Yes, um, uh, actually, we 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 have two two res two responses on this. Uh, as Fabrizio uh, said, uh, we are we are trying to structure and and uh, and and um, and uh, provide international st standards through what we call the uh, international standards and guidance published in twenty twenty two, and uh, we are we are we are starting now the the reviews against these. Uh, uh, international standards uh, and guidelines, and we are thinking of setting up a global quality assurance register, probably by 2025 or 2026, but uh, uh, so that could uh, list uh, all those who have successfully gone through uh, the external review. Um, we that's the that's the con that's the concrete part of it. But in Kwahi, we are also very keen to think about. How what the future could be, and that's the research part of uh, of Inquahi. So we have the global study that is ongoing uh, right now, but also we have our 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 events and and other research projects uh, that are specifically uh, uh, devoted to think about the the likely future. Like in Tokyo, for instance, in May 2025, it will be what we have called the Big Bang Theory, when there is huge, some huge change affecting higher education that it incidentally uh, affect the quality assurance. And we need to think about a new quality assurance model. One of it may be why not having a unique quality assurance body for the, for the whole world? I doubt it, but I mean, the question needs to be raised and discussed. And probably it... it it, it could be interesting to have these discussions with the quality assurance uh, uh, practitioners and connecting with the rest of higher education sectors. And that's where probably the, the, the international higher education area, you know, uh, uh, is, 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 uh, is relevant. So th is that the discussion is not only encapsulated, you know, within those engaged in quality assurance, but definitely, you know, diffuse with the, with the others. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Fabrice. And uh, if I can take uh, um, chair prerogative, I'd like to follow up on your response. That I, because I did ask uh, the same question myself. Many of us may have uh, asked the same questions uh, um, to um, uh, themselves about a single politician's body. Uh, I mentioned how do, the diversity of higher education systems, uh, also um, we different countries may be uh, quite uh, um, uh, still quite protective about the um, uh, higher education policies and priorities given that uh, education plays such a, an important part in uh, in the development of national identity so there are issues around respecting uh, uh, different national higher education systems but there are areas of higher education delivery uh, for me where the international quality assurance community where national quality assurance bodies are struggling, such as transnational education. There are still uh, significant quality assurance gaps out there. And uh, for those particular types of education provision, I have wondered at times, could there be some form of uh, international accreditation body bringing together, perhaps acting as a platform for cooperation for national quality assurance agencies to come, to, be, to come together, develop agreed standards for transnational education and trying to uh, collectively act as a collective, let's say, quality assurance body, but definitely something very interesting. Um, unless someone else would like, Borin, yeah, I can see that you got your hand raised. No, I think uh, this this merits the debate in a way. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, I think uh, uh, thinking about one global body seems to me a bit challenging in, in this context. 
uh, first because of the geopolitical context, uh, because also of uh, the diversity of the uh, of the systems, and uh, uh, probably the maybe the 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 fact that it can uh, maybe not necessarily have a global body, but can drive better and more uh, transparent um, a form of quality assurance is the technology, because technology today allow us to uh, capture, to scan, to uh, identify, to uh, so it, it it has a double-edged sword in a way. It can also aggravate the situation with the chat GPT, with other tools that uh, can create an institution from scratch. And uh, so the, I think, uh, but uh, um, in a way, I think the, the point would be if I am today, if I want to advance the agenda, I would think about more capacity building uh, common language, common resources, yeah. rather than trying to have one agency that uh, uh, will accredit everybody on earth. Uh, I think uh, I, I, would, I would go for a more soft power. And uh, because capacity building, engagement, a common language can create much more common ground. And maybe that can lead to uh, a kind of a, uh, an organization that can uh, can drive. But I I think there is a path to go, and and that path should be about capacity building, knowledge sharing, uh, uh, open uh, data, etc. That will can drive this agenda. Over. Absolutely, Boreen, and that, that that links to another question which uh, um, has been posed by Sharing Pelden, um, which is how can established and recognized quality assurance agencies supporting support emerging quality assurance agencies in aligning with international standards is around is not to that piece around sharing good practice uh, sharing lessons learned capacity development and networks such as Hinkway or the regional networks play do play a key role in uh, in uh, um in delivering that function um and uh, and the but there is still much more work that these networks can do in terms uh, around capacity building um and sharing of information um now unless uh, anyone else here would like to uh make other comments on these issues i uh i was going to consider another question uh which was posed there and uh, and that is i think it was specifically to you andreas or to something that you mentioned um um and i don't know whether you've got something to say about different interpretation of trust between the global north and global south uh, or different interpretation of trust in different regions or in different sectors and anything that come to mind there no just to clarify no no, no i think trust is trust uh, wherever you go <laughs> it's an interpersonal uh, relationship it's a, and it's a it's a it's a, a key uh, moral value uh, between uh, any kind of entity um so there's no difference between north and south and east and west when it comes to uh, interpretations of trust what i'm just uh, i think what i was trying to say and that might have this been misunderstood uh, and probably not 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 well uh, developed from me is very much what Boren just said what we need to have is a common language uh, uh, capacity uh, and uh, at, and a very honest discussion about interests and these are national interests uh, these are uh, international interests uh, so that people can trust each other on an uh, uh, on an uh, on a, in an egalitarian basis. That's all I wanted to say when it comes to trust. So there's no differences in interpretation of trust. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, now going back to our reflections, somehow we already touched upon uh, this aspect um, in uh, in our uh, consideration so far. But if I were to ask you. What do you consider as the main stumbling block towards uh, uh, the development, if not of an international higher education area per se, of uh, the international education community coming together, and perhaps with specific reference to the Global Recognition Convention, what would be the stumbling block that would uh, um, jeopardize uh, the implementation of such an important uh, uh, ambitious document such as the Global Recognition Convention. Mm -hmm. I can start if you, if you please, if Fabrizio. Um, I think uh, there are some, let me call them uh, objective factors 
and others that are uh, more uh, call them uh, context and, and geopolitical. The, the objective factors is that uh, today, for example, we have uh, only 35. Can I mentioned 100 candidates to fight the regional convention, but still, if we are speaking about the global. Uh, today we have uh, 35 countries that ratify, so we need much more member states that adhere to the principles of uh, the global uh, convention to be to be uh, able to uh, engage in in serious um, uh, collaboration and trust, etc. Also, uh, today we have uh, an ICNARIC, we have a, a emerging information uh, center network in in Latin America and uh, in Asia. Uh, but still, uh, we have uh, none in Arab region, and uh, in Africa, we have established one, but still to be operated. And we are working with Kiara and, and, and her team in, in Chimea to, to support, for example. So uh, we are lacking still uh, some, I would say, basic uh, infrastructure that will, will be needed to build uh, that trust and to, to advance with it. So I think uh, that's very important. The other is more uh, geopolitical, uh, is that there are uh, powers that are not necessarily the ones that can drive toward uh, common good and toward uh, uh, what uh, uh, Andreas was mentioning, uh, trust and uh, uh, honest engagement. We have, to be, uh, we have to be frank about that. So I think there are uh, objective factors that we would need to address, and I think the global convention with its implementation will be able uh, to address, but there are other factors that uh, uh, could be uh, in a way preventing us. And maybe one uh, m uh, additional factor that uh, very fast evolving, um, was, which was mentioned by Fabrice in the beginning, we have a landscape that is becoming even more complex. If you take higher education system in one specific country, between the public and the private, the online and the uh, and the uh, diversification of, of providers, the different type of institutions, uh, uh, the new credentialing uh, models. So we have a we have a, a I would say it's bargaining uh, and uh, it's a dynamic one, but it makes it more and more complex, uh, even to understand within a specific country. Not to speak about region, not to speak about international. Uh, and in a way, we are like a, a kind of timeliness of our action will determine how much we are able to understand, to eventually regulate, to make transparent, to make uh, uh, more, more inclusive and equitable. Uh, I think that dynamic is, is something that we really need to take very seriously because today, what are we quality assurance, assuring when you look at the private provision in some countries, this is 70% of the, of the offer. So how, how you deal with that? So these are some, I think there are some factors that we would need to cope with as, as an international community, obviously. Over. Thank you, Maureen. Very good point. Um, Fabrice? Yes, I would like to uh, thank you very much, Boren, and I would like just to, to prolong a little bit on the time factor, uh, actually, because um, if, we, if we're thinking about this uh, international higher education space, we, we, we said that it may look differently from different from a regional network. We see how it takes much time for general networks, you know, from from the agreement to the implementation, it takes 10 years. But if we think about, uh, you know, a, a dialogue on another type of, 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 of uh, higher education area, as we're discussing uh, now, uh, we may consider the time factor differently. And, and, and uh, the idea is to try not to be stuck in time. Otherwise, uh, the international higher education will remain a, a concept and uh, everyone will talk about it, but probably the initiatives grad will gradually disappear with no relays. But we should also avoid rushing times at the risk of not involving all the stakeholders. So the, 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 we have to find the right time, uh, the, the, the right pace. Uh, and I'm convinced, even though we don't know really today what would, what, uh, uh, an international higher education area would look like, but having a, a kind of draft action plan or timetable with schema and so on would help. And there is, and there is, there is uh, uh, an agenda of having the global convention operational by 2027, which is after tomorrow. So the, 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 it comes from the discussions we had already with the, with the Boren, Andreas, also Chiara, uh, that we have, you know, some, some key milestones and, 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 and an agenda. Because sometimes when, when you have global conference, global uh, initiatives, you don't have a political impulse. 
uh, it works when you have it. When you have Bologna process, you have you have a calendar. When you don't have a calendar, it's difficult. Here, thankfully, with the, with the global convention, we have an agenda, and I think it could help us. You know, to to think from now, twenty end of twenty twenty four to twenty twenty seven, what could be done realistically and within these two years. I find it uh, uh, reassuring and also uh, super challenging, but maybe there are some some ways to find among us. Thank you, Fabrice. Chiara, would you like to come in there? Or yes. Either in response to what Boreen and, and Fabrice have said or around that question, around the main stumbling block for you? Yes, uh, maybe regarding the main stumbling block, I guess this was already said, so of course, uh, uh, investment <laughs> in the sense that uh, uh, cooperation, I mean, uh, before uh, um, uh, economic investment, I would say human investment, because cooperation is a labor intensive work. It requires time, so it, it requires willingness, uh, flexibility, etc. Uh, and of course, political will, this was underlined uh, very well. Um, the other point, uh, uh, Andreas mentioned, uh, uh, and also Fabrice and Boren, I mean, we see also some tensions and some changes. Uh, I mean, we do see uh, some of this. I mean, this was already said, like this tension between uh, education as a common good and as a private commodities. For us, of course, the extreme case for us, it's uh, fraudulent qualification, uh, uh, fraudulent institution, etc. Um, another tension is to, uh, it's about recognition, actually. It's a tension that we do see uh, uh, between uh, having a rigorous recognition system and uh, having a more, I can say, and between the need for students that sometimes we also have, and in certain societies, this will be maybe even more and more. So we see also this uh, uh, tension. Another evolution, I will not say attention, but the evolution is the evolution of the concept of qualification. Because here we are speaking about the Global Convention on Qualification, on recognition of qualification, but actually the concept of qualification is shifting, is evolving as all the concepts. So we see the concept evolving uh, and enlarging the scope of what we mean with qualification. And I think this is actually very well captured by the Global Convention, that the qualification, this concept is trying to be enlarged to all the pieces of learning that the student is taking, the lifelong learning, micro-credential, but that's add another layer of complexity, how we can ensure quality of this piece of learning to have a good uh, recognition. No? At the end of the day, it's in the interest of the student that I should not study again what I already know, but how I can uh, uh, do this. So I think there are a number of, uh, I would say, challenges, if not some blocks, but challenges. Um, but then I think, and time, I very much agree with Fabrice, we need time. I mean, uh, from a European perspective, we took uh, 40 years <laughs> to dialogue. And uh, I mean, I make you a concrete example. Uh, now in the European region, we speak about automatic recognition, but mm -hmm. uh, we started this conversation 25 years ago. Well, no, 20 years ago. And uh, when we started this conversation, automatic recognition was not possible, not desirable, because it was seen as a way to treat to hinder cultural diversity in Europe. So this has changed a lot, but we need we need a 20 years. So I think uh, those are some challenges and maybe I will follow uh, also what Goran already said. One uh, also, um, one thing that we should do more is to work on data and the research. Also to highlight these tensions and to understand as a community also as a scientific community and the academic community. And here, I think it's very important the role of universities uh, to support us in, uh, let's say, recognizing, understanding, analyzing these tensions and see how we can uh, uh, work together uh, on this. And on this, I will conclude on a positive note, looking to the challenges that actually uh, working together, we, we solve some challenges. Boran ref um, referred to the refugee rec recognition of qualification among refugees. I mean. Uh, 10 years ago, it was very difficult to recognize uh, qualification held by refugees without educational documentation. Now it is possible. There is a rigorous procedure uh, uh, that was developed. Uh, and I think, uh, I mean, this is a sign that even if, where there are difficulties, uh, there is, with cooperation, we can find together some solution to this. Thank you, Chiara. Really interesting and uh, in fact fascinating. Now, Andreas, over to you. Then I was looking at the time, and clearly time flies when you have a good time. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll let you probably say the final words and uh, and before we wrap up, Andreas. 
Well, Fabrizio, if that's the if that's the uh, the way we're going, then uh, let me just change my argumentation for a moment from no, please. We, we, from we can, depend, depending on the length of uh, of your input, yeah, we yeah. may have time for final observation for everyone. But yeah, yeah please no, address so the question. Say I'll, uh, I'll change from uh, stumbling blocks oh. from the negativities to the opportunities, uh, just as Jack also was wanted to show. So, um, well, first of all, let me congratulate especially my colleagues in the uh, in the area of quality assurance and recognition, because what we always forget is really that this has direct impact on lives. You are transforming people's biographies by creating uh, opportunities. Uh, and that's incredibly important to note uh, in the very bustling and, uh, and, and stressful times that we are. Um, I want to congratulate UNESCO for the Global Convention. Uh, it is an enormous uh, milestone, um, which has been a discussion, uh, Chiara mentioned 40 years of <laughs> the European discussion, but at the global level, this has been going on for, I don't know, I think it was started before the Second World War. So it's incredible that in 2019, uh, the international community come together to adopt it. And we're very much hoping that the ratification process is uh, going to be longer, uh, but be very much shorter than the, the many, many years that it's been in the, in the, uh, in the discussions. Um, but I also want to say that there are amazing opportunities coming out of the various discussions of the World Higher Education Conference, the WEC that we saw a few years ago in Barcelona, where we talk about new models of what the universities need to be. And this speaks also to, Boren, what you're saying about what is in higher education today. Is it transnational? Is it there are new various new forms online uh, um, and, 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 and other uh, forms of uh, universities that we actually also at the IAU, because what I haven't mentioned so far is, of course, the World Higher Education Database, the WED, where we're having increased troubles trying to, through taxonomy, trying to categorize what is a higher education institution. It used to be so easy. And what especially is an accredited and recognized one. So that's a very important one. Um, but yes, there are various different uh, new models of uh, pedagogy that we are trying to uh, also put forward, and that's uh, interdisciplinarity, social inclusion, sharing of resources, brain drain, and especially, and I think we can all come together on this, is communication and data. Communication that we all speak together. Chiara just mentioned the role of higher education institutions, and in a more that we, there needs to be a clearer link between an exchange between the recognition and quality assurance uh, uh, levels and the higher education institutions themselves, that there is a more integrated system. And that, of course, we can do at the local level, at the national level, at the regional level, and hopefully also at the international level. So that's very much what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas. Now, before wrapping up, Chiara, Boreen, Fabrice, would you like would you, would you like to share some very final thoughts? 20 seconds, 15 seconds. And uh, if, if you've got any burning final comments that you would like to share. No, I would like to share the optimism from Chiara, Andreas, and I'm sure also Fabrice. Uh, uh, I think we, we have to be uh, optimists and we have to continue acting together. We have an opportunity. Uh, the Global Convention uh, is an opportunity for the international community and for the individuals, because that's, I think, the, at the end of the day, what uh, Andreas and Kara were emphasizing is that this is to serve and to leave no one behind. So if, if we are serious about that, then obviously we cannot sit in our comfort zone and, and think we don't, we don't need to engage. I think we need to engage. We see the challenges, we see the opportunities. And I, I think the Global Convention, um, and, and Fabrice eloquently mentioned that, is we have a 2027 uh, milestone to to be operational so i think we uh, but we cannot wait we need to act and we need to create that ecosystem around the global convention what we are calling international area of higher education wherever the, the term is so that uh, the convention is implemented is is operational that every individual uh, that uh, needs uh, that uh, recognition benefit from tr fair transparent inclusive uh, I, I would like to be optimist uh, and join uh, Kara Andres and I'm sure Fabrice as well over uh, yeah ab ab absolutely we, we we the fact that we have a calendar and uh, we have to make it uh, tangible uh, and and visible and I think it, within two years I think it's uh, doable to to have a rapid measurable and, and uh, perceptible concretization 
So that uh, that gives hope. So thank you for raising hope in this uh, mid afternoon. Anna, any any final word from you? Just to second this, uh, let's say this wave, uh, uh, and to uh, to say that uh, we already have the platform because uh, this uh, dialogue is exactly an example of how the global convention can push more dialogue and hopefully more call to action. So just thank this you. from. Now, before thanking you and thanking the delegate and wrapping up, I'd like to go to um, to the webinar chat because uh, very interestingly and very, um, yeah, very nicely, uh, Edward Cheng has shared what uh, I guess some uh, AI app consider as the um, the action point from this webinar. Uh, so, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read them out. Advanced implementation of the UNESCO Global Recognition Convention. Absolutely. Uh, explore the feasibility of a global quality assurance register listing agencies that have undergone external review. Yes, we're working on that with Inquiry. Um, organize a conference in 2025 to discuss the Big Bang Theory. This is actually happening, Inquiry, the Inquiry conference in Japan in May. Uh, so we're looking forward to, um, uh, uh, to welcome the international education communities there. Support the establishment of national information center networks in the Arab region in Africa and develop a draft action plan or timeline for making progress towards an international higher education area. Very good, uh, that, that, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, I, never, I never tried that uh, AI function. It is an interesting way to conclude uh, a webinar, for example. We have so a, with these, a yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. So on this note, really, I would like to thank uh, our panelists, Boreen, Andreas, Thank Chiara, you. Fabrice, and I'd like to thank uh, the delegates who have uh, joined us in this conversation, have contributed with their questions.